Hi, this is Mrs. Kidman, and in this video, we are going to be discussing inverse functions. So what is an inverse function? Well, when we are talking about this idea of inverse functions, maybe, there we go. So when we're talking about this idea of inverse functions, inverse functions are kind of known as the opposite of another function. And so what an inverse function does is it undoes whatever that function is doing. So for example, if we have the function x squared, the inverse function of that is the square root of x because the opposite of squaring something is square rooting something. Similar, similarly, if we have something like 2x, the inverse function of 2x is 1 half x because dividing by 2 or x over 2 is the opposite of multiplying by 2. So inverse functions basically undo whatever the other one is doing, and that's how we find them. So let's take a look here at how we can determine an inverse function algebraically. So what we're going to do is to find the inverse, we undo every operation until we get back to what we started with. So sometimes people like to say, remember functions are typically denoted with f of x. Sometimes we'll say that it's equal to y, and what we want to do is we have 2 x plus 3 equals y, and we want to solve for x instead of having it equal to y. That's kind of what an inverse function does. So what we do is we have to figure out what the function does to then reverse it. So what happens if I put a 5 in here? Well, if I were to put a 5 into this function f of x, what we would do is we would have 2 times 5 plus 3, right? And first thing we would do is that multiplying, so 2 times 5. 5 times 2 would give us 10, and then we would add 3 to it, so we would get 13. And that is everything that we've done, so our output is 13. Now that we're at 13, if we wanted to find the inverse or the opposite, we would just work all those steps out backwards. So we would say, I start at 13 instead of starting at 5. And then instead of adding 3, I do the opposite, which is subtract 3, which gets me to 10. And then instead of multiplying by 2, I do the opposite, which is divide by 2. And so that would end up giving me 5. So my output is 5. Notice how that input versus the output ended up being the same. Now, what we talk about with these inverse functions, as mentioned before, is we basically want to undo all of those operations we were doing. And the way that we do that is we want to basically solve here for x. I want to figure out what that would be instead of solving it in terms of y. And that's going to be our opposite function or our inverse function because it's undone every operation. So here, what we've done to x is we've added 3 to it and we've multiplied it by 2. So to find the inverse of that, I need to do it in the opposite. Now typically we do it in the way that we would solve an equation. So we start by getting rid of anything that's adding or added or subtracted, and then we divide or multiply as appropriate. However, sometimes that's not always going to be the case. We'll always try that method first and see what happens. So in this case, we're going to solve for the inverse by doing the opposite. So the first thing we want to do is subtract 3 from both sides, and we get y minus 3 is equal to 2x. And I still want to get that x all alone, so I'm going to divide both sides by 2. And we end up getting that x equals y minus 3 over 2. So now that we've solved for x, we want to write our inverse function. So when we denote an inverse function, what we do is we actually use this negative one to show that it's the opposite. Now, you might have seen that when you talked about trigonometry in the past, where we talk about sine and inverse sine. Inverse sine is actually the inverse function of the function sine. Who would have thought? And so what we want to do is we want to use this negative one to imply that it is the opposite of our original function. And then what we want to do is write it down. So this one is x in terms of y but we still want to have a function in terms of x. So what I'm going to do is use this function here, but instead of writing y, use an x. So x minus 3 over 2. Awesome. Now, this is one way we can write it. It's not a wrong way, but some people typically like to see it linear instead of in this fraction, because fractions can be a little bit intimidating that way. So we're going to take each piece. Remember, there's a 1 in front of this x and divide it by 2. So that's 1 half times x minus three halves. So that's what we would do to figure out what an inverse is algebraically. So let's take a second to undo some of these other functions. Now remember, we typically like to undo add subtract first, then undo multiply. If there's a exponent of any kind, whether it's a radical or a um, typical exponent, then we want to make sure that we undo that next. Things like that. So let's take a look at finding the inverses of these ones. So what we're going to do here is remember, we're going to pretend that this is y. So it's 1 half x minus 3. The first thing I want to do is add 3 to both sides. So we get y plus 3 equals 1 half x. Now 1 half x, we have two options. We can either divide by 1 half. But dividing by 1 half is actually the same thing as multiplying by 2. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 here. 
and we end up getting that x equals 2 times y plus 3. So what does that mean that our inverse function is? Well, our inverse function, remember we use that negative 1 next to our f of x is going to be this, but instead of a y, we're going to put an x. So 2 times x plus 3. Now this is one way to write it. A lot of people will end up multiplying that out, and so our inverse function would be 2x plus 6. Fantastic. Okay, what I want you to do is take a second to go over how you would solve this next one. Again, we're going to do the same process. We're going to move things from one side to the other and solve it that way. So we first want to start by setting it equal to y. So I've got y equals 6x plus 3 halves. And then remember, we want to undo our add or subtract first. So we're going to subtract 3 halves from both sides. And we end up getting y minus 3 halves is equal to 6 times x. And then we want to divide both sides by 6. And we end up getting y minus 3 halves divided by 6 equals x. Now, this is not a very beautiful equation there. It's kind of complicated with that fraction in a fraction. So what we want to do is simplify it when we write out our, our inverse function. So the inverse function of x is going to be x minus 3 halves over 6. Now we can rewrite this as x over 6 is the same as 1 sixth x and 3 halves divided by 6. Well, let's break it down. 3 halves divided by 6 is really the same as multiplying by 1 sixth, right? Because if we divide by a number like this, we are going to flip the action, flip the fraction. So this becomes a multiply and this becomes a one over six. And so then as we multiply this out, we get three twelfths or one fourth. So minus one fourth. And that is what that function is gonna turn into as our inverse. So again, you can see the way that we find an inverse function is we undo all the operations around it. And that's kind of how we can find it algebraically. Now, there are other ways that we can also find inverse functions. And that includes finding the inverse function of a table or of a graph. So let's do both of those simultaneously. So we are going to, we have here, we're given two functions. One is the inverse of the other one. And what we're going to do is use this information to observe what happens when we find an inverse function. How does that relate to the x, y coordinates? How does that relate to what the graph looks like? So let's take a look here at our two different options. And we are going to end up graphing f of x in red and g of x in blue. So I'm just going to outline those in those colors there so that we can see it. Now, the very first thing we want to do is complete these tables so we can see what happens. So I would recommend using a calculator here. You can also do it in your head, but we've got 2 times negative 5 plus 3, which ends up getting us a negative 7. We've got 2 times a negative 3 plus 3, which gives us a negative 3. We've got 2 times negative 1 plus 3, which equals 1. We've got 2 times 1 plus 3, which equals 5. We've got 3 times 2, which is 6 plus 3, which is 9. And 2 times 5 plus 3, which is 13. Awesome. OK, then we want to go to our inverse function here, this blue one, and see what happens. So as I put those other ones in, we've got 1 half times negative 7 minus 3 halves, or 1 and a half, and that gives us a negative 5. I've got 1 half times negative 3 minus 3 halves, and that ends up getting us a negative 3. I've got 1 half times 1 minus 3 halves, which gives us a negative 1. I've got 1 half times 5 minus 3 halves, which is a 1. 1 half times 9 minus 3 halves, which is a 3. And 1 half times 13 minus 3 halves, which is a 5. Now, before we get started in graphing this, one thing I want you to notice is look at these points. Notice how the ones here are the opposite order of the ones here. So what is the relationship between the ordered pairs of, F of two functions that are inverses one another? Well, based on our original function, its inverse is going to take the x and y values and switch them. So if x is one and y is two, its inverse would have x is 2 and y is 1. So those values just switch. And we can see that when we end up graphing it. So let's take a look here at graphing these in red and blue. So as we graph this one, we've got a negative 5, negative 7 here. I've got a negative 3, negative 3, a negative 1, 1. Oh, that's not 1. A negative 1, 
one that's up here, a one five, which is up here, a three nine, which is up here. And then that 513 goes off our graph. So let's go ahead and graph this line here. We're gonna graph it in red. So our line's gonna end up looking something like this, which is pretty awesome. And let's extend this line a little bit so we can see. Okay, so there is that red line there. That represents our red function. Next, we wanna graph our blue function. Now notice how those X and Y values have switched there. So let's graph them. So we've got a negative seven, negative five. I've got a negative three, negative three. I've got a one, negative one, a five, one, and a nine, three. Awesome. Now let's go ahead and put in a line that'll go right along with it there. Bam. And let's make it a little bit longer on this end. So we've got our line here. And those are what they look like. Now let's compare these graphs here and see what happens. So for every point on the red, its opposite is on the other side. So how does it relate to this line down the middle? Well, what it does in comparison to this line down the middle is it actually is a mirror image or a reflection straight across. Now this line here is the line of y equals x. And that really comes into play because we can see that it goes straight across. So the distance here is the same as this distance. This is the same as this distance. This is the same as this distance. Obviously, these points are both on there, but you can see how they have that same distance. It's really just being reflected straight across that line y equals x, which is why those x and y values switch. So when it comes to graphing inverses, what we can do is we can just take the points that we're given, switch the x and y values, and plot them. So let's take a look at an example here of when we would use those graphs to do it. Now, there are obviously three examples here. I'm only going to cover one of them to go over how we would do this. But of course, if you want more practice, feel free to pause the video at any point and practice doing it on the rest of those graphs. So what we're gonna do here is we wanna find the inverse functions of the graph sketch below, and then we wanna label the coordinates on the new ones. So remember, what happens with these graphs and with our tables is that our X and Y values are gonna switch. So in our new function, instead of it being at one four, it's gonna be at four one. And instead of it being at negative two, negative five, our new one's gonna be at negative five, negative two. So negative five, negative two, four, one. And then we've got our line here that is going to connect those two. That looks like this. Awesome. So we can see how, again, just like we mentioned previously, that these distances are gonna be the same here between those points and that line y equals x. So that's what we're gonna do. Anytime they ask us to graph the inverse function, what we're gonna do is take the original function and switch the x and y values. It typically helps to have a couple x, y values for us to look at in order to switch, but that's kind of what we do. Now, the very last thing we're gonna talk about is how are inverse functions related when it comes to that composition. Now, when we talked about the composition of functions, we mentioned how composing f with g and composing g with f will give us a different answer. However, that is not the case with inverse functions. Because inverse functions have that related, that relationship between the two of them, that one is the opposite of the other, what we're actually going to see have happen is we're going to end up seeing that y, that when we graph it, we're going to end up getting that the composition of the function is just going to be f of x equals x, or whatever that composition is. So f composed of g of x is going to equal x, and g composed of f of x is going to equal x. And the reason why is think about what happens with those functions. They're exactly the opposites of each other. So as I look at that algebra side, remember how we undid everything that was there? Well, now I'm going to take every, all of the undoing steps and put them into that problem. So it's just going to get rid of everything but the x. It's super awesome. So let's take a look at this, these two examples to show that they end up equaling x here. So we first want to compose f with g. So remember, we're going to do this part on the inside first. So this is the same as f composed of g of x. So everywhere there's an x in function f, I'm going to put a g of x. So what this is going to look like is f of x, or f of g of x, is what we want to say with our composed function, is going to be 2 times the function g, so 1 half x minus 3 halves, plus 3. Now what happens with this function here as we do that? Well, you can see that we can multiply this 2 in and distribute it. I'm going to simplify this, and we end up getting x minus 3 plus 3. Well, minus 3 plus 3 cancel out, and this ends up equaling x. Awesome. So then to make it an inverse function, we want to do the composition the other way and also show that it gets x. 
So we're going to put in f of x into g everywhere that there's an x. So in this case, we'll start down here. We end up with 1 half times 2x plus 3 minus 3 halves. Now, just like we did before, we can use that distributive property here, and we end up getting that x plus 3 halves minus 3 halves. So our function is going to be equal to x plus 3 halves minus 3 halves. Well, this part's going to cancel just like before, and it equals x. So how do we know that these two functions are, are inverses of one another? The compositions going both the directions end up equaling x. So that's how we can check. So let's take a look at one last example here to show whether or not two functions are inverses. Now remember, to show that they're inverses, we have to show that f composed of g of x is equal to x, and we need to show that g composed of f of x is also equal to x. So let's take a look at what happens here. So let's start with this first one. So we've got f composed of g of x. Well, that's going to be 5 times 1 fifth x plus 2 minus 10. And that's going to be, as we use our distributive property here, x plus 10 minus 10. And those cancel out, and we end up getting just an x. Awesome. So now let's check the other way, g composed of f of x and see if that one will also equal x. So we've got 1 fifth times 5x minus 10 plus 2. We use our distributive property here. 1 fifth times 5 is just x, or just 1. 1 fifth times negative 10 will be negative 2 plus 2. Well, negative 2 plus negative 2 cancel, and it ends up equaling x. So are these two inverse functions? Yes. Yes, they are. So that is kind of an introduction to intro inverse functions. Inverse functions are functions that undo the steps of the other things. So how does that relate when it comes to tables and graphs? Well, it reflects it straight across the line y equals x, and in our table it switches the x and y values. If we were to find the, compo the composition of those two functions, or the composite function, between a function and its inverse, the composition will always equal x, whether you do the function composed with the inverse or the inverse compo composed with a function. It doesn't matter. But that is the cool thing about inverse functions. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. But again, that's kind of how inverse functions work. They're just the opposite, and they undo what the original function does. Please check out future videos in which we talk about one-to-one -one functions and how those are related to inverse functions and why it's so important to determine whether or not a function is one-to-one -one before we calculate its inverse.